Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Tuesday, April 30th. A new report projects a gloomy future for Social Security and Medicare. What options does Congress have to make it any brighter? And we've confirmed that the MCAS system, as originally designed, did meet our design and safety analysis criteria and our certification criteria. Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg faces tough questions during the company's shareholder meeting. Looking at prosecutors' roles in overcharging and mass incarceration in a new book by a New York Times Magazine investigative journalist. Your closet will never be the same anymore. High tech meets high fashion in a show of wearable technology at the Museum of Science and Industry. Imagine a computer so powerful that it can help solve the riddle of dark matter and what the universe is made of. A supercomputer just that powerful is being developed in the Chicago area. Meet two of the people helping create it. And it's the end of the, end of the line for a much-loved Rogers Park restaurant and community hub. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. Suburban students walking out of school. Amanda Vinicky explains why, plus more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Brandis, scores of South Suburban Homewood Flossmoor High School students marched out of their classrooms, shutting down Kedzie Avenue in a protest calling for justice. They're outraged after some of their white peers wore blackface and posted photos online. The students say they want school administrators to take action and to punish the boys. Officials earlier said they support the right of students to stage the protest and that diversity training is part of the district's strategic plan. Illinois is hoping the adage, what's old is new again, will hold true when it comes to hemp. Before it was banned in the 1930s, Illinois was a major producer of the crop. State and federal laws recently changed as of today. Farmers and entrepreneurs can apply for a state license to grow and to process hemp for industrial use. One reason that our application is so detailed and we ask a lot of questions is that we want to, obviously we want to make sure we know where the crop is being grown and that we want to make sure that those TH, that it doesn't get abused and that we're going to be out there testing it to make sure that those THC levels stay down there where they need to be uh, so that the product is used the way that it's intended to be used for. The hemp plant looks like marijuana, but it is naturally lower in THC. It can be used to make hemp-based CBD oils, and hemp fibers can be fashioned into rope, clothes, and plastic substitutes. The new owners of embattled Westlake Hospital can move forward with closure plans. This after a state review board voted 7-0 to zero to approve the owner's request to close the Melrose Park facility. Those opposing the closure had hoped the review board would wait to rule on the closure request until pending lawsuits by the Cook County State's Attorney and by the Village were resolved. As for the weather, showers, possibly thunderstorms tonight with a low around 46. There's also a flash flood watch in effect until tomorrow morning. Also tomorrow, more showers and thunderstorms with a high near 65. And now, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. If you are expecting to receive Social Security benefits, and most of us are someday, brace yourself.
Costs for Social Security are projected to exceed the program's income next year, which means beneficiaries may not get all that's been promised to them. Now, that's according to a new report from the trustees of Social Security and Medicare. The report also says Social Security funds will be tapped out by 2035, and for Medicare, that year is 2026. Although Congress has known the programs are spiraling toward bankruptcy, it has yet to come up with any viable solutions. So what's holding lawmakers back? And of the possible solutions, will any of them make older and younger voters happy? So joining us to offer their take on those questions and more are two of our favorite economists, Michael Miller, an associate professor of economics at DePaul University, and Edward Stewart, professor emeritus at, at, of economics at Northeastern Illinois University. Welcome back to Chicago tonight to both of you. Good evening. Good evening. Michael Miller, let's start with mm -hmm. you. So what are the main takeaways from this report? The report is that the system is collapsing as everybody has expected for decades. And it's a demographic problem. We simply don't have enough young people to pay in enough money to pay for all the people from the uh, baby boom generation, made promises which are greater than, than we can afford, and people are living longer than anybody ever expected. So we're simply running out of money. Edward Stewart, your takeaways? Well, it's one of those things, it's one of those nice problems because there are, according to the report, there are 63 million people uh, receiving Social Security benefits and uh, 176 million paying taxes to support them. It's a pay-as-you-go. It's not dollars in a cookie jar somewhere. It's, it's a transfer payment program. The, the reason I say it's a good problem is that there are 63 million people, I among them, who are getting benefits. And um, when Social Security was passed in 1935, the life expectancy for most Americans was about 60. So if you promise people that you'll give them benefits after they turn 62, it's not much of a problem. So. The report says that in 2035, um, the funds, the trust funds in the Social Security uh, balance will run out. Now, it doesn't mean that Social Security will be broken. There'll be no benefits. It just means that the taxes that are being paid in by the tax uh, payers aren't sufficient to meet all of the obligation. So if nothing happens, then the people who are beneficiaries after 2035 will get something like 76 or 78 percent of what they had expected. So simple uh, solution is to do one of two things, reduce the benefits now or raise the taxes. Taxes now, Social Security taxes, that, sur that fund the old age survivors and disability, uh, employees pay 6.2 percent, employers pay 6.2 percent, so it's 12.4 percent. And most economists agree that it really is the employees that pay all of it because the employers would pay. So you can either raise that number to 13 percent, 14 percent, or you can cut the benefits or do some combination of both. Now, if you read the trustees' report carefully, they make some political judgments. And one of the political judgments they make is that people are more likely to support a tax increase, believe it or not, than a benefit reduction. Now, one of the issues, and I always tell my students this, is that people who get Social Security, old folks, vote. People who pay Social Security taxes, my 21-year-old students, don't vote. So if Congress is going to be make a political decision, which is what they do, right, they're much more likely to raise the tax level than to cut the benefit level to stave off this reduction in benefits that's expected to happen in 2035. So, Michael Miller, we've known about Social Security and mm -hmm. Medicare reaching insolvency for some time mm -hmm. now. Does this report offer new information that we didn't already know? No, it's exactly what we knew before. And what people have to recognize, they, they keep thinking about this thing called a trust fund. There's no money there. The money's already been spent. Over the years, we've paid more into Social Security than we've given out in benefits. Rather than taking that money and putting it somewhere, they took the money and they spent it, and they replaced it with pieces of paper, IOUs, and gave it to the Social Security Administration. So I know it's supposed to go broke in 2035 or something. It's already broke in terms of, let's say it's $100 million they have to come up with. They ask the trust fund for those, those bonds. There's no money there. The government has to come up with that money regardless. And what will happen in 2035 is they'll have to come up with the money regardless. All, pa all payments come out of future out of the uh, production at the time. So I think there's, we have to, like Ed says, we either have to cut benefits or we have to raise taxes or, or change the rules. In other words, you can't, you can't retire until you're 70 or if you work, you can't get benefits or if you work and you uh, get, we're gonna tax it, oh, 
very, you know, a high tax rate or something. You could change any of those. In addition, Social Security is not a, is not a property right. Congress next year could pass a law and wipe out Social Security and it's gone forever. And there's not a thing we can do about it. Well, and so... And That's, people are living longer and working longer sure. is, is the prospect of, of raising or changing those ages at which you can access Social Security and Medicare more politically feasible? It, it is only in one sense. Uh, Ed and I, we worked indoors. We didn't, we didn't lift you know, hard things. Uh, we're not people out there working our butts off in manual labor for our whole lives. And at 65, we're maybe pretty well off and some of these folks, have their, their bodies have been beaten to hell. And I'm not sure that they should have to all of a sudden wait five more years where it would be easier for somebody like me. Ed Stewart, who is most affected by this, this report? What age group? Probably people who are set to retire in 2035. So you do the math, it's people who are in their late 40s and early 50s right now. Um, I'm fairly optimistic that there'll be a solution, but I'm just an optimistic person anyway. Um, but if I was somebody in my late 40s or early 50s, I'd think a little bit more about putting a few extra dollars in my IRA or 401k or something like that. Um, and the other thing um, is that this, like all economics problem, it's not a problem of paper and money, it's a problem of people. What really is going to determine old folks' life uh, experiences in 30 or 40 years is who's working to provide goods and services. That's, that's what the issue is. Now, one of the things that has to happen in the United States is that that 176 million people who are working may be reduced because we're not replacing the domestic labor force. So one of the things that we need and that we have depended on for many, many generations is immigration. So if we stop immigration or we think that America is full, right? I just drove back from St. Louis today. Illinois isn't full, right? It's pretty empty. There's lots of room for people to come work. So the immigration issue is also a social security issue. It's an economic growth issue. And so that's a, another political issue that has to be considered when you're thinking about what's going to happen to the United States economy in 15 or 20 years and who's going to be working to provide the goods and services that old folks are going to depend upon. Michael Miller, if mm -hmm. there is one bright spot, if you can call it that, in the report about the Disability Insurance Trust Fund, what does the report say there? Oh, that one, that trust fund, if you assume that those pieces of paper are real, which they're not, uh, it, it goes, it could go forever. In other words, it's funded enough that it can go to, what, 2050 or something yeah. like that. So the, the disability is not the issue, the, the actually, people that declare disability. There's, there's a really interesting detail in, about the disability, and that is one of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, has reduced the pressure on disability. Because people can get medical care, there's not the incentive that there used to be to go on disability to get Medicare. So one of the many good things that the Affordable Care Act has done has made the disability insurance part of, of Social Security more robust and, and there's less pressure on it because people are staying in the labor force because they can get health care without uh, having it as part of their job. Um, so the first quarter of 2019, it saw a 3.2 percent growth in GDP, gross domestic product. Michael Miller, is that better than we expected? Well, yeah. It, economists are notoriously bad at forecasting. So the fact that it was better than economists expected is uh, that doesn't mean anything. What it was, it was good and it was solid and it was across the board. Now there are some weak spots in the economy, but consumer confidence just came out today and it is strong. Uh, consumers are still making money. Consumers are still spending. Firms are spending not maybe as much. We're not maybe buying quite as many homes as we did before. But the economy is solid. And the economy has done something that we were told it can't do. We were told when Mr. Trump took office that it can't grow at 3% for more than maybe a quarter or two. And that after the tax cut, everything would just piddle away. And it's not. It's, it, the economy remains strong because people are still confident. What does that tell you? Uh, it, it tells me wonderful. I mean, we're coming up on the 10th year of the expansion. So starting in July, this will be the longest expansion of the American economy in history. It'll be more than 10 years old. And that normally is associated with things becoming troublesome, like inflation. The most recent report on inflation shows that inflation is actually slowing as opposed to rising, which is one of the reasons the Fed will not move to change interest rates tomorrow. It's just that things are really going well, and we should enjoy it while we can. And Stuart, how do you interpret this growth? Um, it's pretty good. I'd, I'd quibble with 
Mike's interpretation, the two biggest parts of the growth were inventory accumulation, which can't go on forever. It means businesses are buying things to sell later, mm -hmm. and exports. People, foreigners are buying things in advance of tariff wars and so forth. So my prediction is that the economy will return to its 2% growth pretty soon. And But I agree with Mike, because of that, the, there's no pressure on the Fed this week to raise interest rates again. Or, um, according to my Citibank friends, there's no pressure on the Fed to raise interest rates all of 2019 Correct. anymore. So um, I don't think we should expect anything from the Federal Reserve for economic reasons and also to some extent for political pressure reasons to do anything to interest rates, raise it or lower it in the, in the foreseeable future. Another good thing we're getting here is that the worker is finally getting his and her cut of the pie. Workers were not getting in increases matching their productivity for a long time. And now wages are beginning to rise faster than they have in the past. That's excellent news. And it won't be inflationary. See, one of the concerns is if you pay workers more, they have to pass the higher cost of workers on to the consumer. That's not the case because the worker has already justified the higher pay by being more productive. So it's really great to see the uh, workers getting their cut. Ed Stewart, do you agree with that? Yes, but and I would point out one other thing about Social Security is that it's a very regressive tax system. Right now, the top uh, cap on earnings is 132900 Now, Mike, being a high-paid DePaul professor, gets yeah. more than that. Yeah. But for most Americans, they make less than that, and they pay 12.4% on all of that. Um, Michael Jordan makes $100 million a year. He's only paying 12.4% on the first 132000 so poor people, working class people, pay much higher tax rate than rich people. Now, that could change very easily. One of the things that the trustees report suggests is raising that cap. Mm -hmm. And I would say mm -hmm. to eliminate, to make Michael Jordan and, um, who, and Citibank hedge fund managers pay the 12.4% on all of their income. Yeah. That would be enormous. I mean, that would be an enormous tax increase. On the rich. simpler. Why don't you just take it and start at 50000 and go to whatever it takes, say 200000 And all those people that make the 50000 which is 50% 50 of all households, they would pay no Social Security tax. I, but they would that. get credit for that. Okay. That's my solution, and they never listen to me. And I know it's right. <laughs> so. Really quickly, I want to get to Stephen Moore, whom the president has nominated uh, to the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Miller, your thoughts on him? Uh, he wouldn't have been my pick, but he is... Uh, He's fine. He, he uh, worked for the Wall Street Journal, the Heritage Foundation, CNN. I've heard him interviewed probably a hundred times on the radio. He's on top of what's in the economy. Uh, the, everybody thinks we have to have a PhD in economics to be on the board of the governors. Of the current five, only three of them have, are lawyers. Only two of them have economics degrees. So you can, and the Fed governors are supposed to come from a variety of backgrounds, commerce, uh, banking, agriculture. So he comes from a different Well, background. he does. And we're almost out of time, but Ed Stewart, I want to get you in on this quickly. He, um, late this afternoon, several Republican senators, uh, many of them women, expressing concern. Do you think he's going to be confirmed? No, no. Not only is he wrong about every economic projection <laughs> he's ever made, he's made ridiculously chauvinist remarks about female athletes, about college scholarships for women athletes. Um, no, he's a horrible uh, choice and... and uh, when we were on last time, I said that Herman Cain and Stephen Moore should be rejected. Herman Cain's already gone. Stephen Moore will be gone soon. Ed Stewart and Michael Miller, thank you for joining us. We'll have to leave pleasure. it there. Mm -hmm. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, the head of Boeing addresses shareholders and reporters regarding the Chicago-based company's troubled 737 MAX aircraft. A look at how prosecutors contribute to overcharging and mass incarceration. Playful, practical, and creative approaches to the latest in flexible electronics and wearable technology. From brain mapping to climate modeling and beyond, the potential impact of a new supercomputer being developed at Argonne National Lab. And it's the wrecking ball for a beloved Rogers Park restaurant that served the community for more than 40 years. But first, we are going to take a very short break to ask for your support of this program and to tell you how you can get tickets to a very special Chicago Tonight event. So stay right there. Hello, Chicago Tonight viewers. I'm Phil Ponce. Chicago Tonight is unique in the world of local television. 
So, but just a second. No, Tony, as quite we, quickly, you're, you're, as, you're, you're, just you're, second. You're, as we did that, what you're, we you're, found you're, is that violence went you're, down. You're giving speeches. I, I really would prefer answers. Okay. Lori, like, we asked the tough questions you want answered. Chicago Tonight has the honor of bringing you a wide variety of stories from some of the best journalists in the city. And we do it in depth. No other Chicago television station tackles the stories we do in the way we do, both on the air and online. We're taking a quick break because we need your support. You know that independent, unbiased journalism is more important now than ever before. On Friday, September 20th, join me and my Chicago Tonight colleagues for a fun, behind-the-scenes look at the new administrations in Springfield and at City Hall. We will explore the policies and the players in a freewheeling discussion, and you can join in the conversation as well. Here's how. For a donation of $100, you will receive a ticket to this event at the WTTW Studios in Chicago. Please go online now at WTTW.com slash news or call 773-588-1111 to sign up. Any amount helps keep Chicago Tonight strong, but if you contribute $100, you will receive a ticket to this unique event. Tickets are limited, so don't miss this opportunity. Again, it's Friday, September 20th at our WTTW studios. For more than 30 years, Chicago Tonight has connected you to your community. You can trust us to bring you in-depth, unbiased coverage of the stories you care about most. But we can only do it with your help. So please go online now at WTTW.com slash news or call 773-588-1111 to reserve a seat at $100 each for a Chicago Tonight behind-the-scenes look at Springfield and City Hall. You can join in the conversation and meet the whole Chicago Tonight team. Thank you for supporting the work we do, and I look forward to seeing you here in September. Boeing chairman and CEO Dennis Mullenberg faced tough questions from reporters and shareholders regarding the company's 737 MAX aircraft model at the company's annual shareholders meeting Monday. And it's been more than a month since the FAA grounded the 737 MAX following two recent fatal crashes, which bore similarities according to flight data. In trying to explain the crashes, many have pointed to 737 MAX software, but the head of the Chicago-based aerospace company was less than definitive yesterday. Crane Chicago business reporter Claire Bushy was at yesterday's Boeing meeting, and she joins us now. Welcome back, Claire. Thank you. So let's briefly recap the situation surrounding the 737 MAX. Tell us what's going on. So in October, the Lion Air crashed into the sea out near Indonesia. Five months later, Ethiopian Airlines crashed uh, as taking off from Addis Abeba. Mm -hmm. And there were similarities in these two crashes. The maneuvering characteristic augmentation system, which forces the nose of the plane upwards in certain situations, was found to be activated in both cases. And it, um, it caused both of the crashes. Yeah, and the, the maneuvering, what is it? Sorry. It's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the MCAS system. That's what they're calling it, the MCAS for short. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us what happened at the shareholder meeting yesterday. It was pre-scheduled, right? Yes, uh, Boeing had the misfortune of having their biggest meeting of the year. Uh, just six weeks prior was preceded by this devastating crash, and it was a regularly scheduled event. And what happened yesterday? Um, it was at the Field Museum. There were shareholders uh, who ran some tough questions by uh, CEO Dennis Muhlenberg, and then reporters uh, peppered him with questions for about 16 minutes following the shareholders' meeting. And how did he, how did he respond? How did he address the situation with the 737? Um, he brought it up at the very beginning of the meeting, of course, and he came as close as he has so far to, um, to apologizing. He said that Boeing was very sorry for the loss of life, and he asked uh, everyone at the meeting to join him for a minute of silence uh, in honor of the victims. Um, so can you kind of break down for us the issue with the MCAS and two different plane sensors? Um, there's uh, the angle of attack indicator and a disagree alert that uh, Boeing has been talking about and addressing. Yes. So the first thing to understand is that the 737 MAX flies differently than its predecessor airplane, the 737 Next Generation. The, uh, the engines are further forward on the wings of the MAX. And so to try to make the planes 
feel more similar to the pilots when they fly, you have this MCAS system that uh, will change the uh, whether the plane is pitching down or, or flying straight. And it is fed by data from two sensors. And that if that data is erroneous, or if that data, um, if the data does not agree from the two sensors, it, the MCAS system can be activated improperly. And that appears to be one of the things that happened with these two uh, with these two crashes. And there's also the question of whether or not these two sensors are um, standard features on the plane and whether or not one of them has been activated or deactivated. Yes. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported over the weekend that a alert system that should have told pilots that the bad data was being fed to the MCAS system, that this alert was actually not working. It had been tied to another optional feature on the MAX, and so it, it didn't work in the vast majority of MAXs for the first year of their existence. So in explaining these crashes, did Mullenberg seem to uh, bring up the possible errors on the part of the pilots? Do you, what do you make of that? Is it sort of a legal tactic? Uh, yes, he definitely said that, well, Boeing is accepting uh, you know, responsibility for its part in a chain of events. He made it very clear that it was a, vac a chain of events. And so he, that came across as very reluctant to shoulder the, the full burden of responsibility for this. And when he was questioned by reporters, he uh, was clear that, this is, um, that Boeing's uh, engineering was not flawed. Um. Do you have any idea how many lawsuits are being directed at Boeing right now? We uh, more than 40 uh, are in federal courts here in Chicago uh, for their both Ethiopian Airlines and for Lion Air. So the 737s, they've been grounded uh, since that last crash in March. Boeing says that they are working on the software update, um, but they released their first quarterly financial report. What did that tell us? Uh, that they have taken a, a large hit from grounding of the MAX. It's a uh, billion dollars in cost for this quarter. And so their cash position is much worse than it has been uh, for, for many years. And actually today they uh, issued 3.5 billion in bonds uh, in order to help some with their liquidity. Uh, shareholders had the option of splitting CEO Mullenberg's roles. He's CEO and chairman. They had the option to split that. Mm -hmm. What did they do there? They chose not to. Uh, it got 34% of the vote. Do you get a sense for how shareholders are viewing him as a leader? Uh, Is that a vote of confidence, basically? I, I, it's certainly a vote of confidence from the people who have uh, the most shares. Now, many of the people who spoke at yesterday's meeting were, in fact, you know, small shareholders, and they had uh, they had questions about the safety of the Max, and they uh, they were not shy about putting them to the CEO. Okay, we're almost out of time, but did Mullenberg in indicate whether or not he'd stay on? What do you expect him to do? Uh, he did was asked whether or not he would resign, and he did not respond to that, and yes, he is going to stay on. Okay, Claire Bushy, Crane Chicago Business, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we're back with more right after this. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. The rate of people imprisoned in the United States has quintupled since the 1980s. It's fueled in part by the push to get tough on crime, but it's also led to overcharging, overpunishing, and convicting innocent people. A new book by a New York Times Magazine investigative journalist takes a hard look at prosecutors' role in mass incarceration. The book is Charged, the new movement to transform American prosecution and end mass incarceration. It's part investigative journalism and part legal analysis of how criminal prosecutions can go wrong and why they don't have to. 
Joining us now is the author, Emily Bazelon, who is a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine and a co-host of one of Slate's podcasts called Slate Political Gab Fest. She's also a graduate of Yale Law School and is the Truman Capote Fellow for Creative Writing and Law at Yale Law School. She was also a regular guest on Stephen Colbert's The Colbert Report and more recently his Late Show. Welcome to Chicago Tonight, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So how did this book come about? Why did you want to write this? I wanted to write this book because I think there is a window of opportunity open right now for addressing the worst excesses of the criminal justice system. And I think that's the case because crime is down and people are seeing the huge cost of all of this over incarceration, both the human cost and the fiscal cost. And this is a bipartisan um, sense of awareness. When you look at public opinion polls about criminal justice, you see conservative Republicans as well as liberal Democrats really concerned about the kind of system we've created and asking how we can bring it back um, under control and really shrink it down. You tell the story of two characters, Kevin, not his real name, and Nora. Um, both very different cases. Why did you want to focus on those two? I picked um, a case, Nora Jackson's case, about a kind of old school, hard charging prosecutor pursuing a very traditional kind of approach where you try to get the maximum punishment, you pick who you think the guilty person is, and you go after them with everything you have. I consider that to be a story about prosecutorial overreach and, in the end, about misconduct. Um, Kevin's story is different. It's a story that takes place in Brooklyn, where there is a prosecutor, an elected DA, Eric Gonzalez, who is trying to do things differently. And so Kevin's case starts with a serious felony charge in New York, but Kevin is given a second chance. And so I watched him go through a program that was designed to help keep him out of prison to see what would happen to him. You also write, you argue that prosecutors and their discretion, the prerogative that they have, are one of the main reasons that people are overcharged um, and prisons are overpopulated. How is that? Well, so in the 80s and 90s, when crime was higher, legislators passed a lot of mandatory minimum sentencing laws. And the idea was to take discretion away from judges, to tie the hand of soft judges. But discretion always emerges somewhere in the criminal justice system. Mandatory minimum sentences really bake the punishment into the decision at charging and plea bargaining. Those decisions are wholly in the hands of prosecutors. And prosecutors, unlike judges, they're not positioned to be neutral referees. They have an obligation to do justice, but they're also supposed to win convictions. And so by shifting discretion to prosecutors, we put it in the hands of people who, in a lot of cases, have an incentive to punish people harshly. You even write about how some of them have uh, sort of the, the culture in their office lends itself to being overzealous pursuing the, the strongest charge, maximum penalty. Right. So in Memphis, for example, where Nora Jackson's case takes place, there was a hammer award where prosecutors who win big convictions, long sentences, get praised by having a picture of a hammer put on their office doors. So that sends a message. What's a value here? It's sending someone to prison for a long time. Who's going to get promoted? The prosecutors who do that. And so looking at the system mo more holistically, asking whether everyone um, really benefits from that kind of punishment, whether there are people who, and communities who would be better served by finding other ways to try to prevent crime, um, for example, mental health services, drug abuse treatment, those things can go by the wayside in those offices. What responsibility then do lawmakers have for setting laws like mandatory minimums and the street three strikes you're out laws? Where where do they come in? They have a lot of responsibility. Um, they kind of handed power to prosecutors. And now we're at a moment where there is a real social movement bubbling up to elect a new kind of DA who will exercise their power differently. But in the background, the legislatures are still important, right? Because they could, if they wanted to, um, repeal these kinds of harsh sentences that are still driving the system kind of behind the prosecutors. What about judges and their responsibility uh, for not allowing overzealous prosecutors to go unchecked? That is absolutely an important function that judges serve. Some of their tools have become more limited, um, both because of Supreme Court rulings that kind of rein judges in from being able to rein in prosecutors. But judges often go along with prosecutors. A lot of judges are former prosecutors. And so there can be a sort of law enforcement tilt to what judges are doing as well. What about, um, you write a lot about uh, plea bargaining. What role do they play in this over-incarceration? But at the same time, do they not serve some role in keeping the, the wheels of the system moving? Yes, they do serve that role. We have become a system of plea bargaining. 
um, there are only 2% of convictions that are obtained through trials in a lots of state court systems. Everyone else who gets convicted plea bargains. It is true that plea bargains keep the wheels of the system moving, but they do that by um, inducing people to plead guilty rather than take their cases to trial. And that means they don't get to test their, the state's case against them. We have fewer checks on, for example, bad arrests by the police because we never really test the evidence the state gathers in court. That's one of the changes that has taken place because plea bargaining has really replaced the trial and taken over the whole system. You write about this cohort of the new DAs, um, including you spent a lot of time in Chicago, so you spent a lot of time also talking about Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox. What kind of reforms is this group of, of DAs implementing? You know, the main challenge and promise of the DAs is that they are going to shrink the system down. They recognize that there are too many people caught up in this criminal justice system who have problems would be better addressed elsewhere. And they're doing things like changing the definition of felony theft in Chicago so that people who steal small amounts of goods are prosecuted with misdemeanors. They don't necessarily go to jail. We don't need to send every shoplifter to jail, for example. And I think underlying this is the principle that jail and prison should really be the last resort instead of the rule for people um, who do something wrong. We have 70 million Americans with criminal records in this country, if you include arrest records, that's as many people as have college degrees. And so if we're going to, you know, really think about how to give people second chances, how to make um, all these people do their best to become productive citizens, we have to think of alternatives to jail and prison for them. Where do the rights of the victim come in all of this? Because obviously some of these reforms that are being implemented, they get some pushback uh, both from police departments uh, that do the investigative work, um, but also victims' rights advocates. So victims are crucial. They are absolutely at the center of reforms. And what we're really talking about here is changing how we think about safety so that we recognize that sometimes victims also are poorly served. If you survey victims in every poll of victims now, you see their feelings of disappointment and often betrayal with a system that doesn't solve a lot of crimes, that often doesn't treat them well. And so I think we can actually do all of these things at once, create a system that's more fair and that also also puts victims at the center and recognizes that making a community healthier and safer, healthier and safer, also serves the interests of victims. And before I let you go, what do you want people to take away from this book? You know, here's my um, small but uh, important desire for my book. A lot of Americans don't know that they have the power to elect their local district attorney. The power of a local prosecutor, that's our power as voters. So I just want people to know that, to sort of raise up the importance of these issues, to ask good questions of their elected prosecutor, to think about what they want from that person and hold them accountable for it. Emily Bazelon, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Again, the book is Charged, the new movement to transform American prosecution and end mass incarceration. And we're back with more right after this. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. For the launch of their latest exhibition, the Museum of Science and Industry went with an actual launch. That's when the inventor of a new customized jet suit, get a look at that, complete with mini turbines and an in-helmet display with flight data, took off on the front lawn of the museum. Chicago tonight visited the museum to get the curator's tour of a show called Wired to Wear. Inside, you'll find the jet suit, plus more than 100 inventions that focus on wearable technology. The exhibition aims to lift the veil on clothing and accessories that can boost your health and wellness or just express your creativity. Now we're in an era and time where science and technology and engineering is able to be crafted in our garages. Welcome to a brave new world of wearable tech. So our clothes are about to dramatically shift and it's a lot to do with changes in material science. Electronics are getting flexible. We're getting used to digital devices and so fashion designers starting out are really blending their digital world with the clothing that they're making. The sensors on these motion tracking gloves interpret the wearer's gestures and speak the message out loud. That bracelet on the right can improve the handwriting of a person with Parkinson's disease. Heart problems? These garments allow your doctor to listen in. This defibrillator vest can save a life. 
So one of the real benefits of clothing with embedded technology will be our health. The clothing can gather a lot of biometric data that will improve our health by giving us warning signs early on that something is wrong and just giving us sort of coaching. It's the Fitbit of the future. This athletic wear has built-in sensors to evaluate your performance in real time. Some of the inventions are just for fun, like these stick-on smart tattoos that make music. One of my favorites is called Iridescence, and it is a true example of the mashup between creativity and engineering. It's a collared piece that has all of these motors in it, 200 individually addressed motors that react to your facial expression. So as you approach the, the dress, it, it, it starts to react in a beautiful way. This dress and matching headwear display your brain waves as a neon light show. This one is based on an idea by actress Marlena Dietrich 60 years ago. She wanted a dress that could glow and be interactive. Many of these are prototypes, such as this blinged out prosthetic leg that comes with rhinestones and a built-in stereo. Others are new to the market. That jet suit can be yours for about $375 thousand dollars. We like to talk about how your closet will never be the same anymore um, and that's totally true right now. Things are about to change. This is going to be a disruptive technology on the scale of like our smartphones were, laptops were, personal computers were, and so this is just the beginning. And Wired to Wear will be at the Museum of Science and Industry through January 5th, 2020. And for more information including how and where to get your very own jet suit, you can visit our website. So climate simulations accurate right down to the neighborhood scale. Personalized cancer treatment, a map of the billions of neurons in the human brain. These are just some of the possible applications of the new Aurora supercomputer that's being developed at Argonne National Laboratory in Lamont. And it's set to be the fastest supercomputer in the world capable of a quintillion computations per second. Joining us to help explain the Aurora supercomputer and its potential applications are Rick Stevens, Argonne's Associate Lab Director for Computing, Environment and La Life Sciences, and Bobby Kasturi, a neuroscience researcher at Argonne. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. So Rick, let's start with you. Exascale computing, what does that mean and how does it compare to other supercomputers? Well, exascale is the name that this quintillion operations per second means. So it's, um, about a thousand times faster than the machines we built 10 years ago. And that's the goal that we've had for 10 years, to push that performance envelope by a factor of a thousand. And I think we actually have, there, there are a few other supercomputers, or a couple that Argonne is currently using. I think we actually have video of some of those. Um, but how long has this computer been in development? So we've been working on it, uh, s working on the program since 2007, and this particular machine for about four years. Okay. So it takes a while, obviously. It, it takes a while, yeah. You have to design it. You have to understand the uh, target problems you're going to solve. Um, you have to come up with the technology. Um, there's been many problems we've had to solve over the last four or five years that we've been developing it. And we still have two years to go before it turns on. Okay. Uh, Bobby, you're among the researchers who are planning to use the Aurora. And I should probably mention right now, I think we're looking at the Theta and the Mira is the uh, name mm -hmm. of the other supercomputer. Mm -hmm. um, so Bobby, what can this computer do for neuroscience research? So one of the things I'm interested in is can we make maps of brains that are so detailed that they've never been made before? Specifically, brains are made of these cells called neurons. And in a human brain, there's something like 100 billion of those, uh, more orders of magnitude more than stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and they make thousands of connections with each other. And a strong view of neuroscientists is if I had that map of you, I would know a lot about you. I could know every memory you have, every skill, every hope, every skill, every ability. And the main thing that's stopping me from making maps like that is that the data that that would produce would be maybe a trillions of gigabytes of data. So we would need the world's greatest, largest supercomputers to help us work on those data sets. And you've been working on mapping mouse brains. Why mouse brains? How do those compare? Uh, so a mouse brain is about a thousand times smaller than a human brain. We can argue whether that means they're a thousand times less smart than humans. Uh, but it's a very good model system that lots of neuroscientists use. A lot of the diseases that affect human brains have been replicated in mouse models. A lot of uh, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's we have mouse models for. So if we can understand how the normal mouse brain works, and then we can understand how these mouse models of disease 
differ from those normal brains, they might give us insights into how treating human patients. Rick, what are some of the other applications of the Aurora? Well, we want to use it to build climate models, as was mentioned in the early piece, uh, down to the resolution of you know, a kilometer or so, neighborhood kind of resolution. That would give us uh, unprecedented detail about how global change is going to affect uh, societies and flooding and, and so on, like flooding like today, for example. Um, we're interested in designing new materials. So uh, Argonne works on batteries. It's one of the best places for battery research, and we want to design even better batteries, batteries that would give you a thousand mile range in a car, for example, or a cell phone that would last all week without having to recharge it. So new materials for batteries and for energy. Uh, in my group, we're working on uh, predicting uh, drug response in cancer cells, so we can uh, try to chart a path towards better cancer treatment. Could it be used to study space as well? Absolutely. Cosmology is a big area for us and building models of the universe, how the universe evolved, trying to understand dark matter. What is this dark matter stuff? What is dark energy? How does it all fit together? Can we simulate the universe and try to understand uh, the origins of the universe and, and uh, new things about the universe? I imagine it's pretty difficult to design and build a supercomputer. Uh, give us kind of a, an impression of, of the challenges well, so the there. Team, uh, the, there are several teams working on this. So this computer is built in a partnership uh, funded by the Department of Energy, and it funds Argonne, and it funds Intel, all right, the makers of most of the computers. And it also funds Cray Research, which uh, integrates uh, computers together to make uh, large-scale computers. And there's a team of hundreds of people who have been working on it for the last few years. And over 1,000 people across many of the DOE labs have been building applications for this machine. So when it first comes up in 2001, we'll have about 25 application projects, different, I mean, I mentioned some of them, climate and energy, uh, materials, cosmology, cancer, and so on. But we have many more that are being worked on now by over 1,000 researchers. Uh, Bobby, I understand um, a lot of different disciplines are working on sort of co-designing the Aurora. How do, how do they all come together? So um, I don't, I'm not a computer scientist and don't design uh, uh, computers, but I, I suspect that a lot of these different disciplines deal with the huge amounts of problems that come up. How do you get energy in and out? How, uh, how even down to, I think, how cold the rooms are to deal with the computers because they produce so much more heat. Yeah, I mean, co-design is this process of interaction between people that have applications, that have algorithms, the mathematics, the hardware architecture, um, and we iterate on the design. So if somebody says, well, I want to, uh, I need this feature for my, for my application, the architect might say, that's not really possible within the power envelope that we have. We have to change something in order to do that. Um, or we might say, look, uh, in order for this machine to only consume, you know, 40 megawatts of power or something, we have to give up these features and how can the software compensate for that? So this Co-design is a lot like uh, working with an architect on a house. I mean, you're constantly trading back and forth. You know, how much money do you have? What, how big of a room do you want? You know, how fancy of a bathroom? And so that's kind of what's going on with the supercomputer. <coughs> and you're doing that over and over again at the circuit level, at the memory level, at the network level, at the software level. So it's, it's a very complex endeavor. It takes a whole team of people many years to, to build these systems. And Bobby, you're trying to spread the word to other researchers um, about the use of the supercomputer, encouraging them to, to take advantage of access to them. Yeah, one of the things that shocked me, I think it's probably fair to say that I'm the first neuroscientist ever hired at Argonne, which means I'm the, the best neuroscientist by definition. <laughs> My family tells me it means I'm the worst also by definition. Uh, one of the things that shocked me was that the other disciplines, the other scientific disciplines that take full advantage of this amazing national lab system, of the infrastructure that places like Argonne on offer. Like Rick mentioned, everybody from material scientists to astrophysicists to chemists, you sort of leverage the uh, infrastructure. And neuroscience and, and a little bit less medicine have not. They haven't taken advantage of these huge, comp especially computational resources. And for those fields, and my field, neuroscience, we're becoming huge big data people. That the amount of data that most neuroscience labs collect is beyond the ability of that lab to analyze, or maybe even the university that they belong to to analyze. So sooner or later, we will have to leverage the national lab system just like these other scientific fields have. And in your field, can you use supercomputers to make neuroscience more exact? So we do that literally every day. So every day we produce maps of brains using microscopes at Argonne, and that data gets shipped to Argonne supercomputers, where I think the other piece to mention is that they're real world experts there on how to take algorithms that run on normal computers and run on supercomputers. So we tap into that expertise every day, actually. Um, Rick, the project got some funding from the Department of Energy. What's their interest here? 
Well, the Department of Energy runs the national labs, so they've always funded Argon uh, ever since the beginning, back in the 1940s. So the Department of Energy has a mission to lead the U.S. in physical sciences research, uh, to push the envelope on science and technology in areas from energy and and physics and, and biology and chemistry and so on. And so in order to do the best science, we have to have the best tools. And so the supercomputer is probably the most generalized tool that we could ever have, but it complements the other tools that the labs have. The lab, for example, Argon has a, a very uh, bright X-ray source called the Advanced Photon Source. And putting these two tools together, and Bobby's research uses the X-rays and electron microscopy to get these images, and then you need the supercomputer to assemble that data and to filter it and to merge that data into coherent things. So the Department of Energy is really uh, exists to, to advance uh, the scientific foundations for the country and, and, be, and to enable economic progress uh, that build on top of those. And so supercomputers are a critical part of national scientific competitiveness. And DOE has always invested in supercomputers ever since the first computers that were used um, during for defense activities, and now uh, the open science labs like Argonne and other DOE labs have the biggest uh, machines for open science. Okay, Rick Stevens and Bobby Kasturi, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. And after more than 40 years, the Heartland Cafe, an iconic Rogers Park restaurant on the corner of Glenwood and Lunt, is being torn down. Architectural salvage specialists began working on the building last week to rescue some of these Sullivan-esque ceramics that decorated the exterior. And today, a demolition team began dismantling the main structure in preparation for redevelopment. The Heartland, which opened in 1976, aimed to serve, quote, good wholesome food for the mind and body with a healthy order, side order of progressive politics. Shortly before it closed at the end of 2018, we spoke with two of the original founders. Here's Phil Ponce with another look. I was teaching at Columbia College. I was uh, developing this theory of uh, progressive institutions that serve the community. We came up here uh, after we learned of the closing of Lackey Steakhouse. Uh, a guy told us this place was available. We came up and it was a rainy day and the clouds cleared and the sun came out and there was a rainbow. <laughs> and we said, this is a special place. We're going forward. Michael James and Katie Hogan owned the Heartland for 36 years. They sold it to current owner Tom Rosenfeld in 2012. James and Hogan didn't have much restaurant experience when they started out. I worked at a country club in my hometown and uh, got fired right away for eating a leftover steak off of someone's plate. God, does that ever <laughs> not surprise me. I worked at two food establishments, um, Little King Sandwich Shop right over on Sheridan Road, and uh, I did host at Pizzeria Uno downtown for a little while. With $4,000 borrowed from family and friends and an army of volunteers, they set to work transforming an old neighborhood steakhouse into a new kind of restaurant. We were very influenced by uh, Frances Lappe Moore in her book, Diet for a Small Planet, which basically says you can't meet the world's protein needs on a meat-based diet. Uh, we had $200 left. We went down to uh, South Water Market, uh, mostly to the Greater Illinois People's Co-op, bought brown rice and beans, some vegetables, and we opened on August 11th uh, to a, a crowd of 43 people. The Heartland soon grew to become a cornerstone of the community. We made it up as we went along, basically, and, and we, we trusted and loved our people. We were definitely politically into rainbow coalition kind of politics, black, white, Latino, American Indian, Asian, and that, that certainly was, uh, became a, a, a formidable part of this place. We were only seven years open when Harold Washington ran for mayor, and I, we immediately said, use us. It was an, a very special night. He, he did walk in. People were chanting, Harold, Harold. It was completely racially He mixed. called it the Unity Cafe. He goes, I should call this the Unity Cafe. A young Democrat running for the United States Senate also stopped by in 2004. He started by interviewing the Obama on the radio show. And then Barack just stood there in front of my entirely packed restaurant. Kids were bussed in by the committeemen from various neighborhoods, they were out there packed. And he spoke, he just stood there and spoke without a note for 45 minutes to people like they had brains. And they were silent and listened and went, okay, yeah, let's make this guy the senator. Politics remains an important part of the Heartland's enduring legacy. 
any night of the week you could come in and see people huddled over their work that they're doing together to better some issue that is important. Rebels in a cafe making plans. Beyond politics, the Heartland Small Stage helped launch a number of young bands while also hosting more established acts. We started doing music, and we had uh, Smashing Pumpkin, Eleven Dream Day. Uh, we had uh, when they were young and unknown. Pete Best, the Jefferson Starship, through a connection that I had, and then much later. Dropping names here. Mike. So the thing about the Heartland that was that it was like keeping lots of plates spinning. You know, I mean, and part of that is part of surviving the restaurant business. Tanja Fernandez worked her way up from dishwasher to front of house manager after coming to Chicago from Colorado. I'm heartbroken. This is my home. It's my safe place. Um, I don't really know what Chicago is without the Heartland in it. Rosenfeld says that owning the Heartland for the past six years was like becoming the caretaker of a beloved institution. I knew what I was getting into, but I uh, wasn't quite prepared for uh, how much Heartland is in the middle of this community and how much the community feels kind of uh, almost a sense of ownership, a sense of uh, membership with what we do at the Heartland. The Heartland Cafe, whether it's uh, just in memory or whether it endures by t the current owner, Tom, finding another place to open it, uh, it will endure. And people in the world will be glad that it does. That was Phil Ponce. Developer Sam Goldman says he is in preliminary talks with the community and newly elected 49th Ward Alderman Maria Haddon about plans for the site. Goldman says he would like to build a multi-story development with up to 60 new apartments, but is open to the idea of the ground floor being set aside for commercial use, including possibly another restaurant. And he says he hopes the spirit of the heartland will live on in the new development. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. If you haven't had enough of Hamilton, here's your chance to see more. And a cancer diagnosis leads a man to donate 400 rare and valuable books to the University of Chicago. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.